Hi Agnes, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, really, really well. It's a very exciting day. Where are We've we? We've been let out, let out of the house, <laughs> let out of Chatham House. <laughs> I think people may quickly realise that was a mistake. <laughs> We've been released but, uh, into the wild. <laughs> but we are in the wild and where have we got to? We are in St Pancr- King's Cross St Pancras Hotel. I think it's the St Pancras Renaissance Sorry, Hotel. Sorry, the St Pancras Renaissance Hotel. But it is in Hotel. King's Cross. In yeah. King's Cross. Um, yeah. And Just, why uh, are we here? Well, we're here for the Chatham House London Conference, which is the big annual conference that we run involving many, many interesting people from all walks of life all over the world coming together to speak about international affairs and politics. Absolutely. We're on the second day, so we're a little bit tired day two. and caffeine propelled. But who did we hear speak last night? We heard Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, oh, who dreamy. was absolutely incredible, speaking on... Uh, not just women's rights, but also sort of storytelling and her, her experience as an author, and she was just mesmeric. And yeah. she is the author of Purple Hibiscus and Americana and Off the Yellow Sun, um, <laughs> and you can watch that on the website now. Yes, and actually most of the conference has been, has been streamed live, so we've got recordings of that as well. And uh, there's been some really interesting speakers. And what are we going to listen to today? Well, we have just finished... The most amazing round table, which could have gone horribly wrong, but didn't. And well, uh, I mean, we didn't think it did. In our own estimation, it was uh, a success. A breakfast round table, so it's all a bit difficult. Half past eight in the morning, trying yeah. to get your brain thinking. Ben but was very worried about his outfit for I was. radio. I was. It's important. I always dress to impress when doing these podcast recordings. Absolutely. The um, Northern Line held us back. I've gone for the Gatsby the number. The nice light blue. It is very Gatsby. Listeners, Thanks. you can't see it, but... Um, we'll tweet a photo. It's dapper. Um, and what were we talking about? We were talking about the question of out-of-touch elites. We were talking about it as people at a relatively elite conference. I think it would be fair to describe it as a conference bringing together global elites. Yeah, and also, I mean, we're pretty mind. elite, aren't we, Ben? Where did you go to Speak uni? Speak for yourself, mate. Uh, I went to Oxford University. Exactly. Yeah. I went Where to did Leeds. you go to school? I went to school in Dulwich. Dulwich? Um, and Not just did... a school in Dulwich. You went to Dulwich. I did. No. OK, we're going to come back to but yes, yeah, so we've got a really interesting round table for you that we recorded live here at the conference. Um, it's a bit of a bonus special one-off episode. You will also have the more standard undercurrents this week too. Um, so double bonus you for you there. lucky people. Yeah. So hopefully you're not too fed up with our voices just yet. Um, but we should have a listen. Hello everyone, thanks very much for joining us today, bright and early. I'm Ben, I work at Chatham House uh, in the communications team and along with Agnes I host the podcast, the Chatham House podcast, um, which is called Undercurrents. It's been going since February and we do fortnightly episodes. Our, Our aim really is to kind of feature Chatham House research but it's also to kind of get at issues that are kind of shaping global society, kind of underlying issues that aren't really dominating the news cycle. Brexit and Trump sort of predominate, don't they? But there's a lot of other stuff going on, so we're trying to find the kind of maybe unrecognised stories. But we wanted to sort of take the opportunity of the London Conference, bringing together so many so many interesting people to, to do a kind of live recording. But I think before we start, it would be really great if we just went round and said we are as we're not on the rule we can uh, <laughs> we can sort of <laughs> introduce so uh, so maybe Indra should we go around that way and yeah sure so I'm Indra Adnan and I'm the co-initiator of a new political platform called the Alternative UK which exists simply to answer the question if politics is broken what's the alternative hi my name is Olav Sherman I'm the chief strategy officer of a foundation uh, located in Oslo called EAT so we're interested in food, and we work on kind of the, the challenges in the entire food system from uh, farm to fork uh, when it comes to you know finding a pathway to make it, make it more healthy and sustainable. Hey, hello. Uh, my name is Max. I'm working on all things digital, strategy, communication, these kind of issues. I'm Agnes, co-host with Ben. Uh, Richard Brand, photographer. Uh, 
I travel, lecture, give workshops, and uh, do a lot of street photography, which is what I'm known for. And I've also been following international affairs since I was a political science major at university of, in, a long time ago. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Ilot Kajoka. I'm from Latvia. I represent Latvia-based think tank Providus, and we are working on good governance issues, including citizen engagement and decision making and strengthening political parties. That's why this topic is very relevant to us. Uh, hello, my name is Alan Phillips. Um, I'm a colleague of Agnes in the Great Enterprise, which is the World Today magazine. Hello, my name is Lynn Eland. I'm a Mercator Fellow in International Affairs. And I work on uh, measures how to trust, uh, restore trust in the EU. Ah, oh. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Great. Sorry. Okay, and sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, Will McDonald. Uh, I used to work in the UK government. I guess one of the things that kind of came out of yesterday for me was this theme of populism and this idea that it's a backlash against globalization and a perception perhaps that there is a global elite that is sort of siphoning off all the good things and not properly representing voters in their sort of national spheres. I think that's something that definitely has a lot of resonance in UK politics. It was interesting yesterday that Penny Morden in her speech said that a big obstacle to increasing foreign aid uh, is actually not that ordinary people don't believe that giving people in need money is a good thing but actually that they don't trust politicians to implement it well. And trust, I think, was something that came out not just at this conference, but also at the London conference. Last year, I remember listening to um, Ida Alken, who's a Danish MP, kind of call out the conference a little bit and sort of say, we seem, the same people seem to travel around the world from conference to conference, speaking about the same problems, uh, a lot of hand-wringing, a lot of concern, but actually we don't then go home and speak to ordinary people and try and work out what to do about it. We just go to the next conference, which, I, which really stuck with me a bit. And uh, she also had a lot of interesting stuff to say about trust. I mean, uh, I think also what would be interesting to kind of work out through this discussion is kind of what, what is an elite? What, does, what do we mean when we talk about the elite? And how also does that um, chime in with uh, the idea of expertise as well? Because I think often it gets elided with this idea of kind of technocracy, and like te technocrats who don't really understand the needs of, of ordinary voters. I mean, do we accept that the people in this room are the elite? Can I just throw in a quick statistic, which I think is really relevant, um, which I came to after I wrote a paper a couple of years ago called Is the Party Over? Looking at Culture of Party Politics. Uh, and it turns out that only 2% of people in the UK are members of political parties. 2% of people are creating the whole political discourse, if you like. Uh, not that they won't vote every five years, but they don't think it's worth their time or money to invest in the political party. And it's not just the UK, that's the same across Europe. So 5% is the, high, you know, is the sort of mean, the average across Europe. There isn't engagement from the people mm. in, part, in politics as we know it. And do you think that's new? Do you think that's, that figure's gone down from the past? It, it does fluctuate. Mm -hmm. um, there are moments, you know, post-war and so on, where it was really um, high, people felt engaged, people felt that they were part of the political process. Mm -hmm. But this is really at a dire level now, and it need, needs to be addressed. Why is it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and and what I mean, what's your take on that? Do you think, uh, do you think responsibility for that lies with the public themselves? Themselves? Do you think actually we, we should be in some way fostering more of a kind of sense of civic duty? It's, it, we should be engaging more, um, or do you think that actually it's a it's a problem with the political elite? Yeah, think? I mean, uh, you know, from our own on the ground, you know, sort of um, discussions it became pretty clear that people aren't interested in politics for a number of reasons. The first one is that it's very hierarchical and there is no role for them to play, right? So they only get invited to vote once every five years. There's really no role for them in creating the manifesto. There's, you know, there's no real serious consultative process. It's very superficial, the relationship between the top and the bottom. So it doesn't really engage them. But secondly, um, the nature of political discourse is not 
common, if you like. It's not what really touches people's lives in the ways that they live their own lives. Right? So it's a narrative uh, issue. Um, for example, probably the most telling thing for us is that when you talk to people about their cares concerns, um, they're not the homo economicus, really, that is portrayed by political parties. They don't only think about having material needs met. They have a lot of emotional needs that they need to get met. And if Brexit and Trump have been any sort of proof of that, is that they were harnessed easily emotionally. Right? So need for belonging, need for control, you know, need for status. These things really matter in people's lives, but it's never offered to them by a political party. So, um, except, you know, if you look at popular movements, you'll see that that's exactly what is on offer. You know, belonging and... Um, well, autonomy. certainly the illusion of it. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not sure it is illusion. You know, and this is the... Uh, hopefully, we'll go into this today. Mm -hmm. um, but the rise of new political movements, new political parties, are quite real in terms of their engagement, in terms mm -hmm. of the autonomy that's offered. Um, but they really exist more on community level. So it's an issue of whether or not uh, national level politics can be more engaging, or whether where you have to foster, um, you know, this meaning and purpose has to has to be fostered at the community level. Hence, the rise of municipalism, localism, you know, all the food elements, the energy elements, but also um, how do we combat loneliness? You know, how do we? You know, I mean, there's. You know, there's so much going on on the ground, actually, and in our daily alternative, it was really easy for us every day to find a new social political initiative that's happening outside of the political bubble, right? Within, it's quite a different thing, but outside the political bubble, so much creativity, so much initiative, um, but that's pointed to by politicians as apathy. You don't want to join in our game, and that, I think, is a kind of elitism that we're talking about. But I think, uh, you know, it's hard to overestimate the difference, uh, you know, if you're a young person growing up today compared to, you know, it doesn't feel like a very long time ago, but, you know, when I, when I grew up, you know, I compare myself with my kids and, you know, when I grew up in, in Norway in kind of the 70s, um, there was an actual national discourse, right? There was a, a, a town square. Uh, everyone watched the same news, read the same newspapers pretty much and everybody related to one way or another to the whole spectrum of political views that the different parties had on offer. You had to hear it all because everyone tuned in to the same kind of national broadcasts. And that's gone. Uh, my kids don't watch news. They, they, they belong to tribes and, uh, and they get reinforced uh, within their particular bubbles, whatever that is, and kind of the other side gets uh, uh, demonized or is, you know, is irrelevant, doesn't really exist. And I really question if you can actually maintain a, a liberal democracy the way we're used to think about it, if there's no town square, if there isn't a national uh, you know, place where actually people have to relate to the, the whole discourse from far left to, to far right, and, and kind of lost that. And do you think that's, is that a symptom of the kind of digital revolution that we've seen, do you think? I think it started in, in a way with what well, was a good thing, the, the liberalization of the media. Um, and then it has been reinforced uh, mightily by, by the social media phenomenon. And now uh, that square doesn't exist. I'd like to uh, bring up the, the example of Germany where I think um, party participation or ro ro enrollment is a bit higher, especially we had this phenomenon after uh, or in the campaign uh, last September uh, for the German new um, government or new yeah, coalition that uh, people enrolled in the uh, Social Democrats party and um, there was a kind of yeah, revival of that. And I would also say that in Germany, uh, contrary to France, for example, or the UK as well, uh, you become a politician also by engaging first on the local level, then going up to the <laughs> federal or uh, regional, and then to the... So uh, I think on the national level, we have a bit more trust in the elites or the government, whereas in the EU, the technocrats, that's as a uh, as far away for, for German citizens as, is, uh, as it is for others. Well, it's, like, that's, it's the same here in the UK, uh, what people say. The unelected, the unelected people in Brussels say, well, 
you've had a vote. You know, you vote for your MEP. You know, what, 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 what? Because people don't know, it's not put in front of them clearly. And that, I think, is, goes to the ultimate question of the whole thing. Are you out of touch? Well, yes, if people don't even realize that they vote for their member of the European Parliament, unless it's Nigel Farage, um, you, you're definitely in an out of the out of touch place. Mm. Well, one of the things that we yeah. were so inspired by um, mm. when we first started the alternative was the alternative vet in Denmark. I don't know if you've come across them. But that's a party that was started only five years ago by um, an entrepreneur called Uffe Elbeck. He's just a, a person who ran a, a really interesting entrepreneurial project called uh, the Chaos Pilots for 25 years. Chaos Pilots more or less spoke exactly what it is. It's how to you know, serve chaos, chaos. Uh, in the 21st century. And so he was always teaching capacity building to people over all that time. And then at some point he joined, he joined a local party then he was invited into national government, became culture minister. He, he lasted there for about a year before he jumped ship and said, this is not, this is not sustainable. I can't do <coughs> politics like this, right? And I think you have to take that into account. You know, is it really required that politics is, is dry, boring, sitting on chairs, you know, looking at people on, on a platform ahead of you? Is that necessary? Or is, that, or is it just lack of imagination or lack of you know, common um, feeling or, you know, connectedness with people. So he started his party with an empty vessel, if you like. It was um, no political program at all. He decided to crowdsource his political manifesto through opening up laboratories all around the country. Uh, and then all of those laboratory spaces were fun, right? He had artists in there, there was music, there was dance, you know, more or less what our young people are buying into now in festivals. And festivals, by the way, are very politically uh, active. So I think we would be wrong to say that our young people are not interested in politics. Um, and he crowdsourced his first manifesto. You know, immediately he got 4% uh, of the vote, got nine, nine seats on the first try, right? Uh, and it's still the fastest growing party in Denmark. And in mm -hmm. Copenhagen, it's already the third largest party, right? With a mayoral seat. It's extraordinary, it can happen. But it's because we're listening to, or because he was listening to, what the needs of people, rather than this is what politics is. How do I respond to people where they are, as opposed to, um, you know, the politics has always been like this. People have to buy into our version of politics. So what we're trying to do is kind of reimagine politics at the community level with a lot of young people um, on their terms, because that would make it popular. Yeah, it's so but, interesting. Um, sorry. Uh, it's so interesting thinking about um, the reception that uh, the Labour Party got in the last few weeks with their uh, their own festival, Jazz Fest, mm. yeah. um, which which has just been met with a lot of sort of I, I don't know if I'd call it disdain, but basically from the press at least, it's been very kind of you're doing what? That's that's so desperate. Like kids aren't going to come to that that sort of thing. And sure, it wasn't it wasn't as big as Glastonbury, but there were still several thousand people that came to a particular place on a particular day and spoke about the Labour Party, which I'm not sure many other political parties in the UK could, could claim as a thing. So maybe there is something in this idea of like trying to rebuild these kind of, I mean, uh, sure, yeah, thanks, I, sorry. I think you, you, you're absolutely right about this kind of basic psychological needs people have, right? Like belonging, autonomy, competence, right? And um, the question is, to what extent do we speak to these, to these basic psychological needs? And I would say we see kind of two developments at the same time. So the one is a kind of secular erosion of arenas or institutions of collectivity, which is also a good thing in a way, right? Um, and then we see this increasing technocratic stance politicians have because issues become ever more complex, right? I mean, what we're trying to do as a government, I mean, these are complex issues. They're not so easy to, to frame them in in terms that speak to this basic psychological needs that people actually feel like competent or autonomous in these kind of issues. But I fully agree with you that there is kind of a, a need of um, kind of trying to find out if even the, the old established parties in Germany uh, can be rebuilt as places of collectivity, which is interesting. So we had this kind of Martin Schulz hype where 35% uh, were aiming to vote for the SPD. I mean, they didn't do it in the end. But, um, so you have this kind of um, 
expressed need for building up new arenas of, of collectivity. And I think that's kind of a, a, a major uh, challenge for a postmodern society that, I mean, after 68, we've been tearing down all these institutions of, uh, you know, like expertise, like teachers and doctors and politicians and scientists. And in a way, that's, that, that's a good thing, right? But I think we, we do have to find like an intermediate position between um, absolute belief in institutions and authorities and absolute tearing them down. And to find this kind of intermediate position, that's like a big kind of search movement we are doing as a society at the moment. I guess that's where we're at. And I think that's interesting when you look at the idea of expertise and experts and where that fits in, because I think the idea of where experts fit into the elite is not as sort of clear cut as we think it is, because I think much of the problem is like a lack of trust in the elite is because of a lack of expertise in a lot of them. A lot of people in the elite don't actually know what they're doing, and so that does lead to distrust from underneath. Um, I would say that the elite, or rather, I think people say elites these elites, days. Yes. Yeah. Because I, I think there is there there is there is a, there is a feeling that uh, government has become very technocratic. Mm. Governments are exceedingly constrained in what they can do, particularly in the European Union, but anywhere else by the by by the bond markets. And there's a feeling that uh, it's not just rich people or politicians, but it's also the media. Um, and it has to be remembered that uh, the majority of the British press is, is owned by foreigners or people who are non domiciled. Uh, and I think think tanks, um, talk about ourselves, uh, are also seen to be part of this sort of nexus of, uh, of money and influence. And they have, to, they have to struggle to prove that they are genuinely independent um, and uh, serving a good purpose. So, in that sense, the people around this table are considered to be part of the elite, part of this, uh, which is often or these think tank structures, which are often supported by by wealthy donors, uh, and uh, that's black market against. Yeah, I think that's like a super valid point about what's what's the difference between public intellectuals and mm -hmm. thought leaders, right? And what's the, the market of ideas? And we're moving increasingly in a direction of a market of ideas where, you know, like thought leaders compete and you don't really know, I mean, who's, who's behind these kind of thoughts, right? And when you think about like the 60s or 70s in Germany or Norway, you know, the kind of TV debates you had where you had this kind of public intellectual sitting there kind of weighting different arguments. I mean, yes, um, there is a change happening in this regard. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, at least if you look at the United States, it's not like uh, uh, there's this uh, kind of uproar against all elites. I mean, you know, Trump is an elite figure, uh, but he is seen to be a self-made man that has kind of uh, made his way in this world, and he's looked up to by a big segment of the population because of that. It, in the U.S., at least, it seems like the, the elite that is really hated the most is precisely the, the kind of the technocratic elite, so the, the people that sit in offices and, uh, and, and claim to know something about something. I, mean, I would say that they were... In, in America, it's the technocratic elites are particularly viewed with distrust because they got there because they have higher qualifications. And in America, all this is very expensive. So these people are seen by those that don't have these qualifications as having got their jobs due to daddy or mummy's paying for a very expensive education. But Evan Davis said something very interesting yesterday, and I think it's something that I've been thinking for a while, and uh, it's referred to a lot in social media, um, which is that the numbers are against the elites, right? And we're living, we've been living in a kind of revolution of connectivity for 20 years now, right? And what we're seeing is the sign that people are able to organize and mobilize and speak up now, right? So it's, the elites are, are going to be under a lot of pressure, so-called elites. And, you know, it's up to spaces like this, I think, to start to challenge us, we have to challenge ourselves. The first thing that I would say around the work, around the idea of experts, is that we have to reimagine what expertise is, right? If we take something like Brexit or the Trump phenomenon, surely the lack of expertise is that we didn't know how people were thinking and feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the lack of expertise. And, and where, where do you find emotionally that? completely out of touch because yeah. Brexit and Trump were built both on a vast amount of falsehood 
beautifully packaged on an emotional basis and semantically far stronger in their arguments. It doesn't matter factually, but semantically, semiotically, if you will, much stronger arguments. So they won. It, it doesn't true. matter whether it's true or not. Uh, it just it, it spoke to people's emotions, and people want to trust their emotions. Well, re reinforce all their prejudices. Well, and, yeah, and, it, and, true, it, and, and it works. You know, at the opposition, Hillary Clinton was the most qualified person in the United States for the job of president of the United States. But she was a terrible campaigner because she couldn't connect emotionally. Uh, the, the Remain campaign um, was just, they assumed that everyone would vote that way and their arguments and their things were all just very quiet and logical and completely boring. Whereas the the leavers were all waving flags and spewing nonsense, but it sounded great. Okay, but then, the, so on a, on a sort of controversial note, if you look yeah. at the <coughs> repeal in Ireland recently of the mm -hmm. of the eighth, there is hope. Well, no, but it, the campaign of that was very interesting mm -hmm. because nobody really thought that they would win, mm. and the way that that was done was basically through women sharing their very personal stories. So a lot of the emotional labour was done from women, but it was like, but it was very gentle. It wasn't impassioned. You know, the no side were very were campaigning in the way that you sort of said, mm -hmm. but yes, one. Yeah. This this is the opportunity of, of right. politics right now, mm. right? Yeah. We're going to miss it if we talk about it as populism, yeah. right? Because I, I really sense there's a sort of dismissal of popular feeling in, in the room mm. at Chatham House, you know, as if it's something that needs to be controlled from the top or needs to be managed somehow, or how can we you know, satisfy these people? The opposite of that is what you're describing, mm. right? Which is to accept that and to really respect, actually, that people uh, on the ground have good cause of complaint. They are disconnected from power. But does that mean they can be emotionally harnessed? That's, that's the danger, right? Right. What should be on offer is what you're describing, which was more like a citizens' assembly type of process. Right? It's deliberative politics at the community level. That's a real possibility and source of political strength in the future, in my view, where people can meet discuss, think about it together, be informed, and make decisions. But they should have the right to make decisions for themselves. Do you think that this is a switch then, potentially, in the way that politicians treat their public? You know, is it a switch from persuading the public to agree with them? Well, listening. To, yeah, listening. And is that happening? I guess the question is, when was the last time a politician left politics? Because they said, I'm not very good at this. David Miliband? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think that was the conclusion. I think he think it was the conclusion that his brother was a bastard. Right. <laughs> um, but I think there's a... So if you look at how reflective elites are yeah. about themselves and their uh, apparent lack of self-awareness, um, and I think they... they although, the, although lots of politicians will acknowledge the world has moved on and lots of things are happening locally, which in a way have always been happening. Um, but they haven't, they haven't found an answer that doesn't involve them at the centre of something, at the centre of the country. Because in a sense, lots of them are career politicians, lots of them haven't done many other things. Um, but I, I think you, there's, a, there's very little reflection on, on the behalf of a lot of elites about their role. That's I'm, going to, to other people. I'm going to throw in something that maybe is, is provocative here. I mean, uh, could it be that, uh, and I realize it's different from country to country, but when I look at my own, you know, uh, m maybe we've devalued the uh, role of politician too much, mm -hmm. and they're not the lead enough in, in some ways, in the sense that uh, most of the best and the brightest in Norway today would never go into politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it, the pay is lousy, and there are much more interesting opportunities elsewhere. I mean, to be parliamentarian in a country like, like, like Norway is not really very attractive. So uh, most people, including folks that I know very well, 
they, they spent some years in politics and then they quickly ended up in the private sector because they didn't see a attractive enough future in politics. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, actually, I'm going to draw my next question to Alan as, as a representative of, sort of traditional media, a long career yes, yeah, in, yeah. in the press um, for various different publications. Do, do you think there is an extent to which we've uh, systematically devalued the role of politicians and the reputation of politicians to the extent that it's very hard for voters to really see them as anything other than incompetent and on the make and especially, uh, do you think that I feel like that is a story that is told often in a lot of our press especially in comparison to Germany maybe the basic principle of the British press is, is to make trouble isn't it? Mm. and uh, the easiest people to make trouble about are politicians because they're in the public eye they want um, they want to be in the public eye um, they don't sue you like um, super rich people um, uh, likewise, okay, there's, also the, there's also the royal family. Yes, so um, the, the power of the press t to undermine politicians has risen enormously, basically. Um, and uh, they pretty much can, cannot do any, anything right uh, in the view of always of some section of, of the media. And of course, when they get into government, they're completely constrained most of what is they promise they are unable to put into practice. Um, I'll just recall that Winston Churchill was for many years MP for Dundee, um, and I don't think he went to Dundee more than once every four years for the elections, but you could do that in those days. You, you were a politician, you know, you were, had a lot of, uh, you had a lot of time to do things, you were unconstrained by worrying about your constituents. These days, there's a lot of pressure on politicians, enormous pressure on politicians to solve um, all problems which in the past might have been solved by the local council. Um, so their, their job is almost impossible, I would say, yes. Um, can I say, I, I think, I, I wouldn't, uh, maybe it's particularly difficult in the, in the UK uh, environment, but uh, in other countries as well, I think you, there could be definitely more courage of politicians to go go out and, yes, strike a more emotional tone maybe, but still keeping this re responsibility of, of not going to the extremes. So basically recognizing these like desires of like maybe being a bit more pride, proud maybe of your country or being uh, recognized of your daily issues, etc. But not be yeah becoming extremists. So I I sometimes think President uh, Macron in France he's always talking about uh, la France qui protège l'Europe qui protège so the Europe that protects us etc. And I find it a bit pathetic. But it it strikes <laughs> it strikes a, a chord with uh, with people like they they feel recognized in in their needs. So I wonder if this and really like uh, going down to, to more basic issues because it's a uh, very common, it's a very general term, but if this could be something that it could be more present in other politicians. But, I'm, I'm quite curious about the way we're describing politicians as if they are some sort of a breed or something, mm -hmm. you know, and that is part of the problem. You know, in this country we perceive, it's not true of all politicians, but what is the perception is, is that politicians are people who did PPE at Oxford. Right. They, were, they were intending to be politicians from the start. They had an ambition to have power. They learned the things they needed to learn to take that power on. And they're a small elite of people who all talk the same language. But why should we think that's a democratic notion? It's not surely politicians should rise from amongst the people who they're connected with. Mm. They should be um, totally... Um, capable of that kind of language because it comes naturally to mm. them, not because they put it on in order to have an effect. You know, that, that really rings false to me. You know, a, a politician today should be of the people, being able to connect to people, and they should be able to relate to him. That's why, or her, did I say that? Yes, I did. Um, you know, which is why the phenomenon now is to look, is to watch you know, mayors, you know, the rise of mayors, not just in this country, but all over the world, as people who are more closely connected to people, are becoming popular figures, yeah. right? And we've even had one instance of that with 
in a city Khan in London, but and there are many mayors actually making their mark as popular figures in the political scene, right? So, you know, why is it if if we can manage to see politicians as people connected to people, then the people themselves can become political because they have a piece of that. Like coming back to Germany, I think there is, there is a role of media in this because um, in Germany, basically, you, do, you find two kinds of reporting about politicians. The one is kind of the Heute show, so kind of making fun of all politicians, which is at the moment backfiring because they are saying, so the AFD people, they're basically stupid, but people think, so that's what you said about the CDU and the SPD five years ago. So that doesn't really, the, the sword is not anymore like working, so to say. Um, the second one is about like, the, like the, the, the press elite hanging around the political elite in Berlin, mainly reporting about the, um, let's say, daily soap uh, of politics in Berlin, and not necessarily reporting about how close most MPs in Germany are to their, to their constituencies. They go there like three days per week. I mean, like the, the ordinary member of parliament in Germany is of the people and is spending most of the time with the people, but we don't really report that at, an, at a national level, which, which is a problem, I think. Uh, the question is what are the right means in terms of media to actually find a more proper representation of this reality, I guess. Where it comes to that, if the, the national media tends to dominate, doesn't it, whether it's television or, or, or newspapers, such as they are, so what happens in Berlin tends to trump what happens in Wuppertal. Yeah, and they, they, there is a role of, of social media in this. I mean, like, yeah. most, you know, like, more modern cutting-edge politicians use social media very heavily to actually report about these activities, and I think that's, that's a good thing, actually. As long as they're at least a little savvy, because it's often, <laughs> Twitter, Twitter has been a graveyard for people who are not really, uh, who don't really get it. Yeah, it's really funny. There's one member of parliament in Germany who has in, in his kind of Twitter description that he's one of the only members of parliament left who's twittering himself, and he's right now the worst Twitter executive. <laughs> <laughs> you should think about the team actually. Yeah, and you have Trump. But we're still it's talking. Right. Across yeah. this great divide, right? Yeah. So from the top to the bottom, right? You're not offering people engagement, and if you don't offer people engagement, they will, in the end, become engaged with each other and protest. You know what? Politics just needs to, you know, to to radically reorganize itself and reimagine itself as something that could be vital, that could be engaging for people. You could argue that that is what's happening right now in Spain, for instance. Yes, exactly, and with Podemos. Those, Podemos and Ciudadanos. Yeah. Uh, two parties that didn't exist just a few years ago, exactly. and now they're the two biggest uh, parties yeah. in, in Spain. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's actually happening all over the world, right? So, so and we just don't seem to be aware of it in this space. I'm, some, I'm kind of surprised by that. Because I feel like we're going between two extremes, because then you also have Macron, who again, you know, created something out of yeah. nothing. Yeah. But then, well, ish, yeah, sorry. Um, but then on the left in Britain and in the States, the hope is Jeremy Corbyn or Bernie Sanders, who are lifelong politicians. You know, they are lifers. They're also older. They're not the young people coming in, and yet young people are looking to them. Now, I will uh, interject a note. I'm I'm, I'm British, but obviously American to begin with, uh, and I'm strongly connected with the state of Kentucky, which is an unusual state in America. It was a border state in the Civil War, and the Civil War is still important in the background of American politics. So it's always been very independent in a way. Mitch McConnell is from Kentucky, uh, the head of the Senate, and I actually did a job for him a long time ago, which is something else. But. Uh, also, there, but the representative from Louisville, where I used to live, is a really good, honest, hard-working uh, Democrat. And there's some interesting things happening in, in, the, poli in the local politics of this state. Uh, a mayor of Lexington, Kentucky, who is a good guy, just lost to a woman. Uh, there's a lot of small... Because this is, as, as many of you have said, it's on the local level, on the small level is where the change has to happen. And it is beginning to happen even in the States as a reaction to the more extreme things. A woman came out of nowhere, essentially, a uh, former military woman, and uh, beat the Lexington mayor in a primary. And they're both good people. But again, it was the reaction. 
against established politicians, even though the established politician was a liberal gay mayor. She beat him, and she will challenge the Republican in the fall. Uh, and I think this is happening a lot because the former Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, uh, way back said, all politics is local. And he's absolutely right. What's the situation in Latvia? Uh, it seems so obvious that uh, the system that we were trying to build some decades ago that was based on what we saw in Western Europe, like those large hierarchical political parties, did not work out at all. Um, they, they, they were set up and they sort of functioned, but this trust in political parties was catastrophic, like 5% uh, only trusted political parties. Uh, and um, people were not really enthusiastic about that. Uh, but at the moment, I see proliferation of new political parties, many social activists blending the lines between social activism and parties and joining political parties, political parties getting more and more social acceptance. Also, by uh, <laughs> democracy festivals, we're having one next uh, week, all the political parties will be there. There are uh, almost all civic activists as well, journalists as well. When we look at uh, um, uh, the, the places of deliberation currently in Latvia, it's funny, but the, the major one is still Twitter, and <laughs> because uh, uh, it's still quite hard to make bubbles within Twitter sphere, uh, even though it's getting easier with these mute and blog functions. But basically, almost everything is discussed in. Uh, um, in, in spheres like that, and uh, to me, this uh, looks like a very, very encouraging, uh, encouraging trend. And the other thing that may might not be true for all the countries uh, uh, is um, uh, attitudes towards experts and uh, te technocracy. If we look at Latvia, and I. I also think that many other countries that are not in Western Europe, the attitude towards technocracy and expert is much less critical than in Western Europe or in America. For example, if we look at the approval rankings, it seems that European institutions get much more trust uh, from people living in Eastern Europe uh, than their governments or our parliaments. And <laughs> some, 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 some years ago, uh, uh, our most uh, popular prime minister could not speak with public at all. He was so technocratic. He's currently the vice chair of uh, Valdis Dombrovskis on Euro <laughs> Matters. He's really not a very <laughs> good uh, politician in a traditional sense of the uh, word. But uh, <laughs> the reason why it was like that because uh, people uh, were comparing uh, these technocratic politicians to corrupt political elite. It was not the technocratic political elite that they were objecting uh, to and that was driving populism, but rather the perception of corruption. Uh, and I uh, suspect that in developing countries it might be even more ca uh, case <laughs> uh, that uh, um, not everyone in, in the contemporary world really objects to, uh, against technocracy. It just seems quite positive, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it just nice. In the long run, if we can survive the short run. Yeah, yeah I, I, that was really interesting. Do you think there are lessons that we can learn yeah. as Western Europe um, from but, this? But one thing uh, that it seems uh, very difficult for Western countries uh, to cross is uh, towards uh, looking at politicians as a separate class, and many of you mentioned uh, this. To us, it's, um, uh, our press uh, is learning from um, the role models uh, like Great Britain, <laughs> and, and, and it hasn't worked out really well. <laughs> That's why right now we are experimenting with, for example, simulation games when we uh, are as a think tank, when we ask top politicians and top journalists <laughs> for a game where we switch their roles, just to uh, just to put them into mm -hmm. each other's shoes. <laughs> and after so, one such a game uh, during last year's Democracy Festival, we had 10 participants uh, all together. Five of them said that they would consider switching their roles in real life <laughs> as well. And, and three more said that they would never, <laughs> never do that because they didn't consider how hard it is for for, 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 for the other side. But the, in a way, like loosening those standards that made sense uh, maybe some that's decades it. ago. That's exactly it. I mean, what we're, what we're doing in our political laboratories is exactly that kind of thing, which is to gain, you know, to, to make it uh, enjoyable, to make it participative, you know, and sometimes playing games. But this ability to stand in somebody else's shoes, 
um, and to distribute the responsibility uh, and to see that you know we've all got a part to play it can only happen when you're actually in real time, you know, with each other. Um, there's a role to play for social media. There is, you know, there's a role to play for structure. Of course, there is, but there's nothing that really beats people in the community that all have some sense of belonging coming together and working it out for themselves in a way that is enjoyable for them. You said the democracy festival. Yes. Uh, that's a great idea. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's what's needed out there. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only question is, who, whom do you attract to these kind of formats? You mm -hmm. know, because my my fear is, I mean, we're doing all these kind of things in in Germany, and the fear is that you basically invite us, right, or yeah. friends of yeah. us, to discuss mm -hmm. about the future of democracy and how cutting edge can it be. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you have to distinguish kind of the technique from the ideology, and you must yeah. not un misunderstood that what we call populism, which is one of the most unuseful terms at all yeah. in politics these days, I would say. Um, the ideology is authoritarianism and nativism, and the technique is populism, is pop culture, right? And um, yeah. yes, we have to be louder, I guess, and more flashy and more colorful to kind of battle this technique of pop culture, but we also have to attack the authoritarianism, and we have to really go to the roots of why are people attracted to these, to this, to this ideology, and and these people hard. will not necessarily yeah. go to all the democracy, you know, fancy conferences. No, no, you have to, you have to work very hard and know, and know about democracy. And I like what the SPD does; yeah. it tries to to work as much close to the grassroots as possible. But as I say, if you don't work hard to actively bring, so you're not talking about community that easily connects. Mm. In all of these communities, you're talking about many micro communities that never speak to each other. Right, so we've just done a laboratory in Plymouth, for example, um, and we've, for the first time we've got people from, the entrepreneurs are the ones that are easy to find, civil society is easy to find. What you don't bring into the space usually is the Navy community, or the hospital community, or the estates community. You have to work hard to bring them in. By the time you have a laboratory space where you can start to play the games, if you like, or reimagine together, you have to be sure that you're doing the important thing, which is to bring people together who don't usually speak to each other. And that has to be across the current political divide. Yeah. Right now, the current political divide is, you know, it's party political. You know, it's divided into left or right, or into, you know, red or blue. It's, you know, you have, for, at a community level, you have to start with going beyond that. And organizing yeah. is a craft, right? Yes. And that's what I find interesting about, like, Ciudadanos and Podemos, because, I mean, the question is the traditional parties um, do we have a monopoly on organizing because we do have a monopoly on the structures and institutions of organizing or do we actually speak to people? Are we actually attractive to people? And I guess that is like looking into the mirror as traditional parties at the moment, right? Yeah. Why, um, yeah, why, why used to be, why, why, why did we used to be the, the monopoly on organizing and why are there other players on the field that seem to excel? The question for me is, is you know, do we have to go a lot deeper? Do we need to actually uh, rethink the um, democratic process itself and the, and, the, and the structures that we've ultimately gotten so used to that we, we can't even think of anything else anymore in terms of how, uh, how we ensure we can have a vibrant democracy in an age that is fundamentally very different from uh, in the time when democracy actually emerged in Europe. There, there are certain religions where um, there is no permanent priest, they're elected from the congregation and they have to do a two year stint and I wonder somehow whether that would be a good way of choosing our MPs or politicians if everybody just had to do it yeah. for 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> like, like jury duty. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's like, uh, uh, you know, uh, co-ops, right, where uh, you, uh, like, uh, the building, Department building, uh, where you have to take a take a stand to to yeah. basically manage manage the building. Yeah. yeah. I, I have just yeah. one more question to, to to clarify. Uh, so, practically speaking, uh, how do the elites reach out to the public? Your you, your argument would be that they really just have to call for more participation and organize and go to the communities, like even the high highest elected leaders, not just mayors, etc. Mm -hmm. That would be your approach? That yeah, I mean, or, I think we can you know, rebuild the structure completely, and I think we have to be a bit patient with that. But I'll give you a really good example that happened in Froome, and a lot of people listening will be familiar with this. Um, the people across the community who used to drink together in a pub had, you know, suffered year after year after year of a council that didn't listen to their 
desires at all. There was no consultation, money was being spent in a certain way. And when it comes to council elections, there's generally about 30% turnout. I mean, you know, people are not engaged, that's just a fact. So these people who cared and wanted to get something done, and funnily enough, who ranged from ex-Labour councillors to ex-Tory councillors and Lib Dem councillors all in the same group, plus a lot of people who've never been interested, decided to take over the local council. All right, and the 17 seats, they called themselves the Independents for Peru. On their first go, you know, with 70% of the vote available, they got 12 seats, so they, they had the majority. On the second go, after one stint of showing people how this worked, they had all 17 seats, right? There is a way for people to become practically involved that will then become building blocks of a different kind of democracy, right? So, and those are the people that have the expertise about their community. What needs to happen is the ripple up effect from this kind of, uh, you know, people taking responsibility needs to be mirrored upwards, right? So it's not a question of just coming to the top and visiting the bottom. It needs to ripple upwards, you know, to, municip to the municipal level and then, you know, eventually up to uh, a national level that is much more geared to listening and responding to what's going on at the grassroots. Yeah. It's, a, it's a switch of culture. And I, I must say that women are very key to this because the habit of listening and the habit of knowing and collaborating is, you know, is what they always bring to the space. So, and it's part of the big change that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well. Thank you so much, guys. I think I just want, we've got to stop, but um, just to wrap it up, we always kind of do this at the end of each episode of our podcast. I wanted to ask, I wanted to kind of go around the table and just ask if people are positive that this is something that we have the inclination and the ability to, to solve this, these big issues. Um, do you, are, you, are you personally positive that perhaps in your country these, these problems are it's going to be all right? <laughs> Leonie, would you like to begin? <laughs> Just, um, Just in a sentence, not, it doesn't have to be a... Well, I'm positive maybe in, in a couple of years' time, because this is a process that takes time. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, in the immediate time frame we can, we can uh, find good solutions. This is a mo process of conscientization, of becoming aware. Okay, so it's going to take time. Mm -hmm. Alan? Um, as regards Britain, I think we should keep our eye on what's happening um, on the continent because our first-past-the-post system um, not only discourages, it makes it impossible, as far as I can see, for new parties to come up. So I think uh, we're not going to see much change uh, until there is a, a fairer system for electing MPs. In the long term for Latvia, I'm very optimistic. In short term, short term for our upcoming elections in October, I'm uh, uh, very worried because the transformation is usually quite a nasty process and the fight is already very vicious so I hope that, <laughs> that for the next four years we are not going the route of Hungary or Poland. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> I think locally I think in America certainly I think things will get better but slowly. Uh, nationally I think it'll take a long time. Uh, Britain I'm just watching because I'm I uh, haven't been engaged enough for some time. Mm. The, the question is if we are going to uh, succeed in kind of overcoming this situation, would cru crucially depend on understanding how like cultural and economic factors are entangled, and we don't really get that at the moment, I guess. Okay. Hmm. I'm gonna sound a little maybe dramatic, but I really, I really feel there is a a huge kind of uh, pressure cooker out there uh, in in our societies and. Uh, there's a huge vacuum when it comes to real leadership. And to me, the big question is, you know, who will emerge as the um, next iconic leader that kind of uh, reads the, the times and then formulates a, a program that people can rally around. And I hope it will be uh, a woman of the kind that you just talked about and not some Mussolini or you know, some, some strong man. Of that, of that kind, or, or indeed more, more of Trump and, and that kind of brand of, of, of leader. Uh, and I think a lot, uh, a lot depends on, on who emerges and is able to kind of capture the, uh, the, the sense of what the future should look like. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when we started this project a year and a half ago, 
I was not sure at all because I couldn't see what was possible. I just knew we needed an alternative. Since I've been working on it for a year and a half, because I can see what's possible, I can see what could arise and is arising, I now feel much more positive. But it, that doesn't mean I feel complacent. It's not going to happen. There are forces out there that are ranged against this kind of possibility. So we have to sort of we have to we have to opt into the possibility. You know, so I'm shamelessly going to advertise the alternative dot <laughs> org <laughs> <laughs> because. You know, people who think, you know, who are asking the question are yearning for something, they do have to step up and take part in something now. Um, I'm relatively pessimistic because I think uh, in the UK a lot of institutions are facing the same challenges, so the church, business, politics, um, and these challenges are not new, they're at least 20, 30 years old, um, and I think it's good that they're, these institutions are being challenged. Uh, I have some hope about what might replace them, um, but equally you can see um, how that could go the other way very easily. Um, I would, I, I would have more hope if there was, if we were going to rip things up a little bit more in the UK. Um, so personally, I would take all money out of politics. I would limit political journalists to three-year terms covering politics. <laughs> so that they have to get out and do something else. Um, I would move Parliament out of London. And I would make Parliament sit for a maximum of three days a week and not give MPs an allowance to live in the city where Parliament was, so they had to, to go somewhere else. Um, but I think unless you're going to actually rip up, you know, as well as electoral reform plus the House of Lords, unless you're actually going to rip up the system uh, in the UK, we're going to end up with a very similar system. So let's rip it up. Let's rip it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, rip it up. What a way to finish. Uh, thanks everyone for taking yeah, part. It's been absolutely wonderful. Yeah.